self-esteem in the classroom from critical teaching, critical thinking, practical wisdom from bell hooks. Teaching in the university setting, I encounter students who are deeply wounded in their self-esteem. These wounds act as a serious obstacle to learning. They are present in both students who are underachievers, who may or may not come from exploited and or oppressed groups and possibly from dysfunctional families, and in students who may be quite confident of their intelligence, but who may also be coming from dysfunctional homes where they were shamed and disrespected. Often, the barriers that I face to self-esteem in my own environment are both twofold. A, defining self-esteem itself. Is it something that's wishy-washy and outside of the purview of a lecturer? And two, how does one tend to it? And I'll just celebrate two ways that I've done that extracurricularly outside of the classroom. On the next page, on 125, Bahooks goes on to say, I became accepting of the need to assist my students with their psychological growth when I began to see this work as enriching my teaching rather than diminishing it. And one of the experiences that I had in the classroom, there was a student who was highly, highly, highly literate. This student, she could absorb books. And so I got to talking with her and chit-chatting with her about the kinds of books that she liked to read. And of course, shared with her the things that I like to read, including, not least of which, is different books of Bell Hooks. And so we would start to read uh, Bell Hooks and discuss it together. What was interesting, though, was that on one trip, we took a lot of trips teaching on this course together. We got I sat next to her and we just started talking about the joy of reading the next chapter in this book. And like many people, there's a family story. For her, the family story was that her father was illiterate, like functionally illiterate, an immigrant from Jamaica who did not know how to read at all. And one of the ways that she began to explore her world and see the world, try to see the world beyond what her parents could show her was books. And so school had always been a place of learning for her. Unfortunately, she had chosen the wrong kind of courses because she didn't have a lot of guidance. And so she had this love of books and we could share it together. Bohox goes on to say, teaching can promote healthy self-esteem in students by showing appropriate appreciation and awareness of their potential. This does not mean praise that praise should be given indiscriminately. It does not mean that calling attention to strengths a student may possess and encouraging her or him to work from that foundation can provide the necessary confidence that is the key to building healthy self-esteem. Oh, sorry. It does mean that. It, it does mean the second part. It does not mean sort of just throwing around praise. And as we often talk about the snowflake generation, that we want to praise them for everything. Oh, you know, you came in third place. But what she is saying is that start where they are, use what they have and do what you can and build on that build on that as a foundation. And so here again, one of the things that I started to see when I would share books and my love of books and start to discuss books with students is that um, in our office hours, when we had offices, um, I could also do this with students. And so one time I even got chills. This was a few years later, a different student, and I was more confident in the power of just literally sitting down and reading bell hooks with students. I called her into my office to talk about her work. And as a writer, I wanted to share with her so earnestly how I had come along my journey as a writer at every level of education since university and how Bell Hooks had been a strong motivator along the way, not just because she wrote to us um, and wrote about us, but and wrote critically. And so she paved that roadmap, but literally the writing itself sparked, it wrote my own experiences or similar to my own experiences. And I can understand so clearly what she's saying, even as her experiences are so different from mine, because of course, um, I am of a different generation, grew up in an urban place. And um, even if we both are from Kentucky. And so I remember reading, which book was it with that student? I can't remember. It might have been, I was doing a lot of black people, black um, people 
and love, you know, salvation, black people and love at that era. This student was um, struggling with her hair transition. You know, she was a first year student. And this is also the time, you know, you have that intimacy with students, black, the black female students that I have do talk to me about their hair journeys. Um, I offered to her that she should, as a university student, start to read the writing of black women and integrate black women writing and authors into all of the work that she does across her university studies so that she can always see herself along that journey. And that's when I sort of literally open up, because I always literally have the books with me, um, open up pieces and pages of Bell Hooks. And as she sat, I'm literally telling him, getting she's not thinking about it, as we sat there in my little office, and she's, I'm sitting, you know, I'm editing her paper, I'm looking at her uh, paper, and I'm making comments on it, and she's sitting there in the interim, just looking at this, and I'm just seeing her, you know, like... It literally is like that scene in The Color Purple where Celie and Suge are reading the letters from Nettie from the very first time. And Suge, of course, as you know, is able to help Celie see herself by seeing herself in the world. And, and of course, finding these letters from her long lost sister allowed her to see that she wasn't alone in the world as she'd always been. She wasn't disconnected, um, orphaned in the world. You know, of course, that it's again that hero's journey that, that transformation that she makes, I'm starting to see that girl in my office just like, I've never read this before. I didn't know people in academic spaces talked about these things before. I didn't know you could write like this before and be here and do this. It's the same exact journey that I had when I and my classmates were reading Bell Hooks together, not just in the classroom, but we'd be sitting in the dorms and each other's roofs, you know, talk about <laughs> Bell Hooks. Um, literally this one, this, like, this is the copy we'd be talking about. Um, and that was me. That was my Oberlin College, um, little sticker that I had, Oberlin College, number 1475. And we'd be talking about that book and Killing Rage and others. And I was seeing and extending that same graciousness through, literally through the written page. And so this was all in the business context. And so I'm telling you that I'm reading the works of Bell Hooks and having these transformative experiences alongside these students. It's as much for me too. And it's in a business context. I teach business ethics, sustainability, and I empower students to write, especially when I teach first year students um, just transitioning into university um, third year students who want to strengthen their capacity to write in different contexts and explain their different ideas in more clear ways. It's always the writing of Bell Hooks that is equally as transformative as literally what she's talking about. It, it's just mind blowing what one can do when you just sit down and as they say, uh, read a book or two. So as they say, read Bell Hooks. And check my channel because I read some of her books to you and we can talk and discuss them together.